Hey everybody, today I want to talk to you about the first scene in the extraordinarily successful 2018 romantic comedy Crazy Rich Asians. And you know, let's get into it. The first scene is a prologue that takes place 24 years before the events of the movie proper and introduces us to our Asians. Eleanor Young walks into a fancy British hotel with her family. They had reserved a room there, but now the receptionist, a racist, pretends they hadn't. We spoke on the phone when I confirmed yesterday. Sorry. Don't seem to have your reservation. He consults with the manager, and they both agree that these people are not welcome there. We're fully booked, madam. You must have made a mistake. I'm sure you and your lovely family can find other accommodation. May I suggest you explore Chinatown? But then, Eleanor goes out and makes a phone call. Next thing you know, she's back in the hotel, greeted by its steward. She just bought the place, and these two cringe lords are probably in big trouble now. To get them off. The floor is wet. So, this scene is kinda great. It's light and airy and energizing. Watching it, we can fantasize about putting shitty people in their place, and it's very much like the iconic scene in Pretty Woman, where Julia Roberts, now flush with cash, gets to tell off a haughty retail worker. Big mistake. Big. Huge. It's fun. It's a good time. And as we step into the film, the purpose of this scene within the greater narrative seems like it will be fairly straightforward. It basically tells us two things, right? First, this is a movie about money, about the people who have it, about what they can buy, about the power it holds. Second, it's a movie where money is complicated. We'll get into the details later on, but Eleanor Young is the primary antagonist of Crazy Rich Asians. You don't like her for much of the movie. The audience then might be understandably inclined to judge this woman for her wealth, to think that she's a greedy douchebag. And this moment works to challenge that story. On a visceral or emotional level, we are instructed to see this family's wealth in terms of oppression, in terms of dealing with racism, writing injustice. They may have too much money, may be imperfect characters, but at the end of the day, there is a reason why they're like this. Money doesn't just represent the things these people can buy or the power they can wield. No, it cuts deeper than that. And I think it's strange then that after this scene, Crazy Rich Asians never wants us to think about money again. Crazy Rich Asians is about an American-born Chinese woman, Rachel, who wants to get married to the love of her life, Nick Young. But she didn't realize that Nick is, in fact, just terribly, incalculably rich. Like, he is the heir apparent of one of the wealthiest families in the world. There's new money all over Asia. We got the Beijing billionaires, the Taiwan tycoons, but the Young family, they're old money rich. They had money when they left China in the 1800s. And the plot surrounds Nick taking Rachel to Singapore to meet his family, where Rachel has to get Nick's uptight mother and grandmother to like her. So, let's ask a question. What drives the conflict of this movie? Specifically, what exactly is stopping Rachel and Eleanor from just getting along. In the book the movie is based on, the answer is simple. Money, class, lineage. Eleanor doesn't think Nick can marry Rachel because she is of low social standing. She is just not suitable for you, Nikki. She does not come from the right background. Ama will never allow you to marry Rachel, no matter how accomplished she is. You don't know how important bloodlines are to her. That's my reading aloud voice for Eleanor. Ah. <laughs> to be sure, there are aspects of this in the film as well. In both works, Eleanor cares that Rachel has a shady father. Your mother's husband is very much alive. During her marriage, she cheated on him and became pregnant with another man's child. And before he found out, she ran away to America. But in the movie, the main conflict between these characters is very different. Now, Eleanor doesn't like Rachel because she's not Chinese enough. She was born in the United States and does not have the same cultural sensibilities as the rest of this Chinese family. <sighs> You're different. This point is raised in the first act of the movie. It's brought up about a million times after that, and it's the central point of the climax. There is a Hokkien phrase, Gagilang. It means our own kind of people. And you're not our own kind. 
That's interesting, isn't it? Because here, the movie obfuscates what you'd think it would be about. We have all these rich people, right? We have our poor, humble peasant girl with a heart of gold. We are reminded over and over that these people are extravagantly rich and that this is very important to them. And yet, the film very deliberately breaks from its source material and tells us, no, our main plot isn't about money or class or hierarchy. We're not interested in those things. No, what this movie is really interested in is an abstract concept of identity in what constitutes Chinese-ness. Or, you know, let's talk about the B-plot of Crazy Rich Asians, and again, we'll start with the book. So, Nick has a cousin, Astrid, who's married to a sexy, sexy man named Michael, but she discovers he's having an affair. Oh no, oh my god. But all is not what it seems. When Astrid stalks Michael, trying to find his lover and potential bastard child, she talks to him and discovers that he was not, in fact, cheating. It was all an elaborate ruse, a prank, to make her think he was a philanderer so she'd end the marriage and be able to save face. He just hated her rich, aristocratic, awful family so much that he was desperate. Face it, Astrid, your parents will never respect my family the way they respected your brother's wife's family. Families. You can't really blame your parents. They were born that way. It's just not in their DNA to associate with anyone who is not from their class, anyone who isn't born rich or royal. If any of this is kind of blowing your mind right now, I don't blame you. When I got to this point in the book, my jaw dropped because this is not how it went down in the movie at all. There, Michael simply cheats. He resents Astrid for her juicy money. You're always the prettiest richest, most perfect girl in the room. And they break up and Astrid tells him off. I just realized it's not my job to make you feel like a man. I can't make you something you're not. Again here, we can see how downright nervous this film is, how it seems to tense up around the subject of money. Michael is not a character, he's a filth demon, and his problems with his wife's family are not taken seriously. No, instead, all this is an opportunity for an absurdly facile girl boss moment. As Astrid tells her husband that he's not a real man because he can't handle her money, she dons an extremely expensive pair of earrings that she bought at the beginning of the film. And it seems like we're supposed to be proud of her for something. Like, wow, isn't she so brave to finally embrace her truth that she's worth billions of dollars that she never worked for? 1.2 million. It just doesn't make sense that I'm being asked to feel this way. It's not fair. This choice is interesting to me because it just further confuses the movie. In the book, the Astrid Michael plot is a compliment to our protagonist's arc. Rachel is considering marrying into this ridiculous wealthy family because she loves Nick too much to not be with him. And with Michael, we see how that decision might go. The emotional wreckage and alienation that this kind of money, these kinds of expectations, can produce. It's not super deep or anything, but you know, there's a there there. But now, these two plots are entirely unlinked. Rachel's plot, dealing with Chinese identity and her boyfriend's mom, has nothing to do with Astrid's plot, realizing that she should be confident and not let any man tell her how to be. These things have no center, no purpose. They're totally disconnected from each other and from any general theme. They're just kind of sitting there, a loosely tied together string of arbitrary events. And in general, you can just see this odd money phobia everywhere in the film. This strange aversion to making wealth a source of narrative or thematic friction. Money doesn't cause any conflict, at least not a conflict with gravity. The role of money is never complicated or explored. The story has no frame of reference. We don't hear the perspective of any normal person with normal thoughts. And the protagonist barely has an opinion on the situation besides Wow, you guys sure are really rich. Notably, a conflict is hinted at early on in the film, as Nick apparently promised he'd come back to Singapore to be the CEO of his family's company, causing tension with the New Yorker Rachel. It wasn't that long ago that you were sure you were moving back home. And, I mean... Rachel loves her job in New York. But even this goes nowhere, is never so much as mentioned after its introduction. Because while the movie may be called Crazy Rich Asians, it's not about them. That is, except for our first scene in that hotel in London. 
what do we do with this strange moment now? And I think the reality is, I had it all wrong. The first scene in the film does not introduce anything, doesn't set down ideas that the rest of the narrative will play with and expand. No, as strange as this sounds, I think it's the movie's emotional climax. See, there are two kinds of white people in this interaction. First, there are the two receptionists who stand at the entrance of the hotel. These are the kind who create problems with their racism and disdain for the other. May I suggest you explore Chinatown? Second, there is the hotel steward who comes down like a beautiful knight, happy to sell them the hotel and make sure that justice can be done. He's the kind who solves problems by leveraging and transferring ownership. As of this evening, my family's long history as custodians of the Colthorpe is ended. And here, what we really find is a kind of mythical, utopian origin for global capitalism. These Chinese people have money, lots and lots of money. And while a small purchase can plausibly be rejected out of bigotry, a large one cannot. The white owning class must inevitably cooperate with the Chinese owning class. And it's through this process that racism either disappears or ceases to matter. It simply cannot stand up to the tide of commerce. Yes, the plot of Crazy Rich Asians does not want us to think about wealth. It will take any opportunity to avoid it, obfuscate it, treat it as unimportant. But that's only because, in this context, it actually is unimportant. Sure, 24 years ago, money was ideological, political. It was something the characters wanted and cared about. It literally cured racism. But those days are over, those problems resolved, and now we can live forever in the shadow of that resolution. Eleanor is rich, of course, but is no longer all that concerned about her family's status. Astrid doesn't need to think about the implications of her wealth. Rachel doesn't worry about her husband's social position. There are literally no white people left in the movie, no more real racial tension for us to think about. Money is omnipresent in this film, poured over every shot, pervading every moment, and yet it means nothing because the world was already bought and sold a long time ago. So that's it. That's the end of the video. Hope you liked it. Hope you had a good time. I ended up thinking it was a pretty good video, honestly. Uh, if you like my work, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and go to my Patreon or my Nebula if you want to. I make a bonus video there every month. This time I talk about Logan Paul's Game Boy table. It's a pretty good video. I liked making it too. And with that, now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Henry R. Seymour asks, Would Arthur be a better or worse show if Arthur looked more like an aardvark? He it would be a worse show. The show is partially cute because of its stylized aesthetic is why. Okay, bye. Thank you so much. Uh, see you later.